thank you all for coming this evening uh, for the community meeting uh, addressing on-demand uh, treatment for opioid use disorder. My name is Molly Carney. I'm the executive director of Evergreen Treatment Services. We offer a, a very large medication-assisted treatment program for adults with opioid use disorders down on Airport Way. So we work with people who are uh, seeking formal treatment for uh, heroin and prescription drug abuse. Um, I've been asked to moderate the discussion today because of the agency that, that I run and the number of people that we treat. We have about 1,400 people in uh, treatment down there. I was also a member of the King County Heroin Task Force, so I worked with a number of uh, folks across the community and in many different disciplines as we are collectively trying to put our heads together about how to help this epidemic come under, under control. Um, lastly, I also sit on the board of directors of the King County Accountable Communities of Health. The ACH, as it's known, is a, a group of stakeholders representing primary care at hospitals, managed care organizations, um, all different kinds of folks involved in the population level health in King County. And together we are trying to um, make the system improve and, and help people out who have been formally left behind in the healthcare system. So the folks who are potentially going to be using the service that you're going to be hearing about tonight um, are covered under the ACH. So I, I wear many different hats here, and again, I've been asked to uh, moderate the discussion today because of my area of expertise in opioid use disorder specifically. Um, we're going to have a panel presentation, and then we'll have about a half an hour at the end for uh, questions that you may ask for the panel. And we're going to start initially with um, introductions across the panel. So I'm going to ask each person to come on up and introduce who they are and the role that you play in uh, tonight's discussion. So. Thanks. I'm David Newman, the Substance Use Disorder Services Program Manager of Community Psychiatric Clinic. Um, my name is Joe Tinsley. I work for the Public Health uh, Needle Exchange Program. I'm Pat Simpson. I'm pastor of the church, and I should just take this uh, opportunity to say we do have restrooms. Uh, is there a locked door between us and them? Yes. Okay. Uh, we got a couple of church members here who can get you into restrooms if you just find them. All right. My name is Shiloh Hassan Jama, and I am the executive director and co-founder of the People's Harm Reduction Alliance. Um, I'm also a member of this church. Great. Thank you, everyone. And thank you so much to the church for hosting tonight's discussion. So we're going to start out with uh, David Newman, who is the Substance Use Disorder Program Manager for Community Psychiatric Clinic, who is going to describe what the program involves, how it came into existence, and how it's actually going to operate. So David? Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad you're here. Um, we decided to, uh, with the help of People's Harm Reduction Alliance, uh, the support of uh, King County, and uh, working with volunteers and people in the community, decided to develop a program that took the usual way that people access opioid substitution treatment uh, and turned it upside down. Because usually there are a lot of challenges in front of people who might want to change or end their usage. Uh, and so some of those challenges involve finding a, a spot uh, that you might be able to do treatment and booking an assessment and there might be a wait list and you might have to have certain kinds of funding in place. So instead of that, we decided to do the opposite, which is work on designing a program where if you uh, want to change your opioid use and you are perhaps a participant in the needle exchange, you could just say, hey, I'd like to see the nurse and I'd like to see about getting a prescription for Suboxone or Buprenorphine, which is a a very effective and safe opioid substitute. And then that person would, on demand, be able to get a prescription uh, by one of our partner uh, physicians from Swedish uh, Ballad Recovery Services. So then peers will help escort people to pharmacies, help them find their way in the community to the pharmacy of their choice. Um, and, and then uh, 
peers also come into play in escorting people throughout the church um, and to the offices we have here. Um, and then as people grow and reduce their, uh, the, or re reduce or end their uh, heroin or other opioid use, then uh, if they want to connect to other uh, providers in the community, such as primary care, to continue at a primary care provider with the opioid substitution therapy, then peers can help link them to that service as well. In addition, if people want inpatient treatment or outpatient treatment for other substances of use, then we will have uh, chemical dependency or substance use professionals here on site to do assessments and link them to treatment either here or in the greater community. And we'll also be bringing mental health uh, providers here to provide those services and again link to if people need uh, psychoactive medications for uh, emotional disorders. So those services, this array of services, it, it will be the first time that in 40 years behavioral health services have been available in the university district, which it's hard to imagine because there, if, if you are not the casual observer, or perhaps even as a casual observer at times, you might notice that there are folks who might seem to be suffering in this community. And so we felt it was very important to uh, put a lot of services within uh, this safe space uh, where that People's Harm Reduction Alliance has set up. Um, we are partnering in terms of our partners. I mentioned Swedish Ballard Recovery Services will provide the uh, physicians uh, on call and on site. Um, community Psychiatric Clinic, my employer, will be providing all of the uh, pr behavioral health providers. Um, and uh, then we'll have uh, People's Harm Reduction Alliance will be using many of their volunteers and peers at all their shifts to get out the word of the availability of treatment and also provide some of the peer workforce to get pr people from where they've received their prescription and now filling their prescription, for example, at pharmacies. We'll also be connecting and have been connecting with partner pharmacies in the area so that that part of the process goes smoothly, that people can get prescriptions filled. Um, and the, the, the purpose of this is to give one more tool for people that, um, that People's Harm Reduction Alliance provides tools to have people have safer lives, prevent overdose, and now if a person wants to take that a step further and then end or reduce their use even more significantly, then we're going to give those tools to folks on demand. Okay. Thanks, David. Um, I'm going to follow up on a couple things that he said. One, one is that um, this Low Barrier Butte project was something that was discussed and really hatched out of the King County Heroin Task Force. So the idea behind this is that it becomes a very important tool in a continuum of care that is being developed across Seattle and in King County generally. What we have had up until uh, really now is people who have active use and then there's programs like ours which is going from kindergarten to college in one step. We offer the highest level intensity of care and many people are not ready to take a really major leap of life off the streets and um, many times in, in living in a life of chaos into an incredibly rigorous program like ours where they have to come on site six days a week to consume their medication in front of a registered nurse, they have to engage in counseling, they have a medical provider, it's incredibly rigorous. So really there has been nothing between those two extremes up until these low barrier butte programs have been identified. And the purpose behind them is really to give people a much easier entrance into the system. They can test the waters, see whether or not the medication helps them stabilize out of their uh, out of control use of act, of getting uh, feeling the effects of whatever substance they may be using, going into withdrawal, and then needing to find another fix in order to get out of the withdrawal symptoms. That cycle is what drives many of the behaviors that you're seeing out in the community, and many of many of the behaviors that are difficult for community members to, um, to tolerate. So the medication actually helps stabilize people so that they can then begin to um, get shelter if they need shelter, get, um, go back into the working world if that's what they wanted to go back into school, uh, to really engage in a life of recovery over time. But it takes people time. So these low barrier pro programs are really very important to help people take the first step into um, that longer term goal. <coughs> 
So um, just wanted to give that background here. I'm going to introduce um, Denise next for a couple of moments, uh, comments from, um, Denise, are you ready to talk? Or do you want to go a little bit later? Or You're good. <laughs> so this is Denise. I don't know. No. I'm a peer support with community psychiatrics, and I've walked as an addict and through the recovery process. I actually took a different route and went to methadone. And if I would have known what I know now, I would have chose the box. And if it was easier for me to get to when I was in active addiction, I would have been able to get on it faster and start my life <sighs> sooner. Like I'm excited. Like I just started two and a half years ago on this road and I used for three years before that and I looked for a year and a half for a way out, and I couldn't find it. And this way would be a lot easier for people that don't know the things that so many other people do. Thank you. Thanks, Denise. Denise also raises the point, so there are uh, two main medications for the treatment of opioid use disorders. There's methadone, which you can only get in a program like the one that I run, and then there's Suboxone, which you can get from a primary care provider. So you, uh, one of the advantages of Suboxone is it's got a, it has a different mechanism of action. It's a little bit safer than methadone is. And um, this is one of the reasons that um, many members in the community have actively been um, seeking assistance from programs like CPC to get involved in making these prescriptions available for people. Because the more that we get the prescriptions out there, the more likely we are to help people get stabilized. And then this epidemic, we've, we've started to uh, chink away at the, uh, the chronicity of it. So next, I'm going to introduce Joe Tinsley from the Seattle King County Public Health uh, Needle Exchange Program. So Joe. Thank you, um, and thanks for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, I like what you said, Molly. Um, low barrier treatments like Suboxone and the programs described tonight, um, it's like kindergarten to college when somebody's trying to enter a program like yours. I've worked for Public Health uh, Seattle and King County Needle Exchange Program for the last 20 years. Um, which my voice always kind of cracks when I say that because I'm like, oh, I'm getting old. Um, but it's been a great and awesome experience. But throughout those, that my time at the exchange, I've had to work with people or I've gotten the privilege to work with people um, who have been in positions of trying to seek out treatment um, and who have run up into roadblocks because of all the hoops that they have to go through to access care. So low barrier treatment programs are like the most awesome thing in the world and it's a terrible adjective to describe them because it really doesn't do it justice. We started doing a low barrier Suboxone uh, program at my program uh, on January uh, 17th last year and we since then we've been able to place 154 people into treatment. The goal of our program, or the design of our program, was really to make it as low barrier, barrier as possible. So people would come into the exchange, engage with one of the frontline staff, and then get immediately hooked up with a public health nurse that would do a medical assessment, have a conversation with the doctor, and within an hour, sometimes an hour and a half, if the uh, EPIC system didn't work quite right, um, would be able to leave with a prescription for a life-saving medication. Um, our idea around it was really the, you know, the easiest we can make it for somebody to access treatment, the more likely that somebody is going to succeed. Um, our initial idea was that we would get people onboarded and really work with them until they got stable enough to transfer them out into another community-based organization for long-term maintenance care. One of the things that we found uh, as a challenge was that there weren't a lot of other low barrier services available to transfer people out. So we sort of bottlenecked where we could only take so many people and have so many people enrolled in our program. So that was kind of frustrating, or actually very frustrating, um, but also gave us an opportunity to do a lot of outreach to other organizations and other prescribers to really highlight that you could work with people in a low barrier manner and find success with that person. And the definition of success can be very different from person to person. So it's either the, somebody that's reducing their use or eliminating their opioid use completely or engaging with somebody around uh, mental health services or housing services or job training services. 
one of the highlights um, and sort of successes of our program, because we weren't able to really transfer people out in a quick manner, we were really able to hold on to people and show people that we cared about them and that we really valued them as an individual. Um, by not giving up on somebody, we were able to then see some of those changes in reducing their other drug use or reducing their opiate use altogether um, or seeking other services. Um, I think having a, as many low barrier services available for people just gives people more options and more opportunities to succeed. That's all I'm going to say. Thanks, thanks, Joe. Um, I heard a story from one of Joe's colleagues at the syringe exchange program, which is that they are finding, correct me if I'm wrong, Joe, but as people come in and uh, try the low barrier but program, they may stay for a short period of time initially, but then they'll come back later and stay for slightly longer, and, and people are getting more and more engaged over time as this uh, program is being made available to them. So that's a good sign, and it's a demonstration of the fact that this really is a continuum of care. It's, a, it's, a, it's a reaching a handout for folks who previously really are not engaged in the system at all. I also want to add that there are a number of different organizations in the, um, the Seattle area in particular that are starting to work in lo with low barrier buprenorphine programs. So this is not the only one in the city at all. Um, we've got programs being run by Valley City's Behavioral Health. It's being uh, pioneered at uh, the Pike Clinic Market downtown. It's being uh, tried in a number of different settings around. So uh, the CPC program here in the University District is just one of many efforts that are, that are um, being piloted. So um, let's see, next round we're going to ask Amber to come up and, and talk for just a couple minutes, if you could, please. Sure. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, I'm Amber, and I go to CPC. Uh, I have about seven months sober now, and I'm <laughs> I'm actually one of those people that had the hard time trying to access care. Like when my prescriptions ran out, I said, "Screw it! I just want off the stuff," and called place to place and found out I couldn't get any care. So I was pretty pretty stuck at home, sick as a dog. So I accessed, I finally called to get an assessment and I had to wait a couple days. And then I got in and then I started the whole Suboxone treatment. And I'm here now and it's very stabilizing. People, once people get stabilized, they're gonna be able to actually move on with their life. But the first step is to get them not sick because that's their number one fear. And that's why there's so much crime in the areas because that's, what they need to get to survive. So if we can get Suboxone in people's systems, then we can start making behavior ch changes and see a positive outlook on the community. Thank you. Thanks, Amber. I also want to point out that um, Suboxone and Methadone both are shown to reduce the risk of overdose death by about 50%. So it's really important to get these medications out to people because if they have to wait for them or if they don't have access to these medications, people are at risk of dying. Um, our clinic down in Olympia right now, because we don't have the capacity and there, there really are no other providers down there, has a wait list of 150 people. That takes people months to get in, every day of which is really a day of risk for them. So it's really important that um, the, the communities understand the importance of medication-assisted treatment that really is understood as the uh, medical standard of care for treatment of opioid use disorders at this point in time, and that the more that we can get this out there, the better off the community is, and certainly the better off uh, folks are who are in need of services. Um, next, we're going to have um, Pastor Simpson come up and speak from the church's perspective. I want to say a little bit about context. Uh, you mentioned this being a safe place. And uh, it's a very complicated place. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, just in this building, uh, in addition to People's Harm Reduction Alliance, uh, we have a radio station. Uh, we have, besides the church, two churches, uh, the radio station, we have uh, the Roots Young Adult Shelter that opens in the evening, feeds them, 
shelters 45 young adults during the night, serves some breakfast and out the door. Uh, about the same time they're leaving, uh, our children's school, which is a full-fledged uh, daycare center uh, plus curriculum, uh, opens at 7, stays open till 6. So we have families dropping off their kids, picking up their kids. We have teachers coming early in the morning. Um, and um, what have I missed? The urban rest stop, yes, which is still operating, though the city is trying to uh, uh, starve it of funding. Uh, so people come in for sh uh, showers, laundry, and restroom use uh, five or six days a week. So, and teen feed, one night a week, Saturdays. So uh, w there are a lot of meetings, too, yeah. Uh, yeah, church meetings, uh, international socialist organizations here on Tuesday nights, etc. Um, so a lot of these people use the alley as their access to the building. Um, and once you get past the end of the alley, you got Mod Pizza, you got the Allegro, you got the bookstore. Um, so this whole environment is full of a mix of people coming for different reasons, uh, accessing different services, or just coming here because they need a place to be. And a lot of those people um, have uh, either addiction or mental health issues or just plain are at the end of their rope because of a difficult life, uh, things that make it hard for them to manage their behavior. So uh, it's really hard to keep the alley a safe place for everybody, uh, from somebody having their coffee at the Allegro to the parent dropping off their kids. Uh, to, uh, oh, the post office trucks. I forgot those. Those are probably our biggest safety hazard. Uh, so, although um, you would think on the surface that offering this new uh, low barrier treatment would be the least controversial thing that People's Harm Reduction Alliance has ever done. Uh, in fact, uh, in this environment where safety is hard to, hard to guarantee, um, it's raised some neighborhood concerns about bringing more of those people into the alley. Um, and my response to that has been that one person at a time, this begins to help not only help those individuals, but build a safer community. Uh, as people are able to come back and contribute as volunteers, uh, or ab able to move on, uh, and not need the services they access here. Uh, but that's going to be a gradual process. Um, in the meantime, uh, the church uh, trustees, before this was approved, um, were very careful to inquire into how it would be managed, how security would be maintained within the building, uh, particularly to secure the children's center area uh, during uh, during their operating hours. Uh, the idea that people will be escorted, uh, that they'll have a support person with them in the building, uh, we're relying on that to provide a, a layer of uh, assurance. Uh, and uh, we, want pe we want everybody to be safe. Uh, and uh, I believe that step by step, person by person, uh, offering these services will move us in that direction. Uh, there may be questions about safety and security later, and we can field them one by one. Who's next? Thank you, Pastor. I think um, you've, you've made a wonderful point, not only um, about how to build community, uh, which you've already done in this uh, sanctuary here, um, but also about how engaging people in treatment really is the process by which uh, you, tur you turn a situation around. So the, you've already heard some stories tonight. You're probably going to hear some more about people who wanted to engage in treatment and were unable to. It's uh, the folks that you want to engage in treatment, you really want to do encourage them to get into treatment because it, everybody is much better off, uh, particularly that person, but the community is as well. So. Uh, next up is Shiloh from the People's Harm Reduction Alliance. So Shiloh. 
Hey, um, thank you. Um, so it, most people here probably know me. If you don't, I was born and raised in this neighborhood. I was homeless in this neighborhood. And I've been a long-term drug user living in, on the streets of this neighborhood. Um, and one day, I, my best friend in the whole wide world died of a heroin overdose lying right next to me. And I wasn't going to take it anymore, and I really wanted to start doing something about it. Um, and I went to all of the social service providers, and they told me that I was a homeless junkie, and the only thing I was probably going to do is die. Um, and a really amazing man named Bob Quinn um, told me that I could volunteer at 5 to 7 on Wednesdays, um, and I did my first shift. And then the next shift I came, I was 30 minutes late, and he gave me this big lecture on how he did not say 5.30, he said 5 o'clock. And it was really the first responsible thing I ever did. Um, and I volunteered at that place, and I watched my friends who were in desperate need of services um, and treatment services slowly go to jail, die, um, lives destroyed, scars on their bodies, hepatitis C, um, with struggling pain and people just yelling at them, telling them they just stop or, you know, they're bad people and they're, they're worthless. And um, again, year after year, all I could do was sit there and cry watching my family and my community die. Um, and I kept working at the exchange and I slowly got a job as the, at the exchange doing, you know, at the Utrecht Exchange with Bob and then with SOS. Then I became the coordinator. Um, and then when SOS uh, stopped doing the exchange and we had lost all funding, I became the executive director with three months uh, rent paid and three months supplies. And we did everything we could, borrowed, begged, and stealed just to make sure we could survive. Um, and again, we started adding more harm reduction services and feeling what, really um, happy that we're in this church with such love and support. Um, I can't talk enough about how positive this church was. And for people who don't know the history, you know, some of the more elderly um, parishioners have um, formed me that in the 50s, they invited African American families to worship here. In the 70s, they invited uh, gay men to be part of their church. Um, and when they let us in, they uh, told us that this was just another generation of civil rights. Um, and, you know, this church has fought you know, for what's right, not necessarily what's pretty. And I think that's always been really important. And, you know, as the Heroin Task Force was created, um, I put myself on the treatment side of it because, you know, we had done surveys before and we had done a recent survey and 75% of opiate users that we serve wanted access to treatment, right? So that means the vast majority of the people that we serve it's trying to get treatment but couldn't get it. Um, and there are many homeless people in this neighborhood who don't have the means to um, get on a bus six days a week to go down to the methadone clinic because, you know, the sad part is there's not a methadone clinic really in the North End, right? And so it was one of those things that I, I took Brad, who was one of the co-chairs aside, and I said, I'll do all this work, but if, really change does not happen, I'm going to come for you. Um, and uh, he reminds me of that. He's sitting right over there. Um, and I, and um, he said, I'll get you Suboxone at your site, if that's what you want. And I can't thank him enough for helping making that happen. I know there's lots of other players, um, but behind the scenes he did a lot. And I feel like for the first time, drug users in this neighborhood and opiate users have an opportunity to not go through the pain that I and my generation had to go through watching their friends and their family die. Because when that happens, all it does is build more trauma onto someone and it makes people, you know, 
more self-hatred and more sad and it, it deepens their addiction and I think the one thing that we've always done and the one thing I'm very happy that we're partnering with CBC because they really feel the same way is that the most powerful thing we can give to people is unconditional love and to really show that caring. And you know, that was the caring and the love that the Labor Cafe gave me when I was a young street kid, and all I had to do was buy a cup of coffee, and you know, I could sit there and draw. You know, it's the same thing that this neighborhood, Gargoyles, used to give me half price when I bought my first onk there. Um, you know, the falafel place would give me cheap falafels, and it was all these individual people who positively reinforced my life and gave me love in this neighborhood. Um, and so I just cannot stress enough the opportunities that drug users are going to have in this neighborhood and how groundbreaking this is to give someone who's homeless, who's in chaos, the tools to um, help themselves and put the power in their own hands and make them feel worth uh, um, something. And it's, you know, every single time I'm at the exchange, people ask me, I want to get on treatment, I want to do this, you know, and, you know, 10 years ago I used to say, well, are you rich and have insurance? Because um, if not, you can probably detox at my house. Because that's all, that's all that was, the system was allowed, you know. And, you know, we had folks in this neighborhood who uh, used to have, uh, you know, let people detox at their house. And there was a small network, but that's all they had. Um, and the vast majority of people suffered and died because we didn't have an infrastructure. Um, and so I really want to thank the church and the board of trustees. Um, they really stepped up and they really did what was right and there's you know hundreds and eventually thousands of lives that will be changed by this simple act of compassion and love um, and I know if Jesus was around he would be a Methodist um, <laughs> so um, I'm just throwing that out there <laughs> so um, and so, yeah, I just want to, we're going to have questions here soon, but I really want to thank uh, everyone here because I want you to look around, and this is the U District, and this is the neighborhood who has always pushed to have more services, always pushed to have, um, to look after each other's neighbors and do what's uh, possible for this community.